to uh, go ahead and let you guys get acquainted with the interface. Uh, just kind of click around and look around and uh, and we're going to get started in one second. And uh, I want to say thank you for joining us on. Uh, this is actually our second Black Movie Night. This is the second time we've done this where we have released uh, a film project and invited our students in to come and uh, check out the film and to see what what we got going on. And so, um, so yeah, so uh, give me one second here. All right, okay, so it looks like we are ready. We're cooking with gas and grease. All right, so let me see here. I'm gonna look in the attendee section and see who's in here. Okay, I'm seeing Adam Epps, I see Adrian, Alicia, uh, it's funny, Alicia Francis. That's so funny. I know somebody named Alicia who has a brother named Francis. That's that's hilarious. Uh, Andrew, uh, Anita, Antoinette, Ashley, Autumn, uh, Ben, Bonnie, Brian. Everything's in alphabetical order apparently. Uh, Carla, uh, Chablo, uh, Derek, uh, Essence, Faye, George, Geraldine, uh, Hat Hat Hatiba. Uh, and I see a lot of other people in here. And um, also, uh, I've invited a few people from our League of Intelligent Black People who are watching on uh, on YouTube uh, to also come in. And what I'll do is in a second, I'll share with you guys the link where you can actually come in and check out the screening. We're about to uh, start the screening in one second. Um, in about, th about 10 minutes, I just want to talk to you guys real quick and uh, give you kind of some background on uh, on everything that we've been doing. Um, in, in case you didn't know, uh, hey, Janice from Louisville. Okay, Louisville, that's my city. That is my city. And I see Ant Antoine, how are you? Um, you know, in case you don't know, uh, I've been on this uh, secret quest to take over the world. Uh, I'm very serious about it. You know, I, I really believe that black people are, uh, are greater than everyone else. I believe that we have the ability to do things that other people can't do. Um, and uh, I believe, for example, that we can... Uh, we can make we can make twenty five dollars out of fifteen cents. I believe that the black mother has been doing that since forever. Uh, I also believe that the black man has the ability to do the same thing. Um, and so my argument has always been, well, if I if I'm ten times smarter than than everyone else than the competition, and I work ten times harder than the competition, then I should be able to do at least a hundred times more than they can do, or with one tenth of the budget. So uh, so basically, one of the things that we've been working on, I mean, extensively. And we're real. We're dead serious about this. We ain't playing with this. Is we are trying to uh, build a black Hollywood. You know, we're trying to uh, contribute. Um, I, I talk to you guys all the time about the importance of us owning our own stuff. You know, I talk to you guys about that a lot. You know, and I, I let you guys know. Um, I make no secret about the fact that I really believe that black people should own. Um, we should just. I don't. Not not just own our stuff. I believe we should own everybody's stuff. You know, I, I believe. I don't believe in, I don't buy into equality. I'm not trying to play catch up. I'm not trying to play the whole like diversity game. I, I'm not playing that game because, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm too cynical for that. Right? I'm too cynical to believe that, um, that a, com cynical for that, oh, sorry, right? that a group that is as competitive as the one that we've had to face, you know, I'm talking about our oppressor, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I am too cynical to believe that our oppressor is going to play a friendly game of equality. You know, I, I, just, I just don't believe it. I don't believe that they're going to just sort of, you know, just politely say, okay, everybody, you know, you get your piece, Billy, you get your piece, uh, Jenny. I, I, I just don't believe the world works like that. I believe that the world is kind of, unfortunately, uh, especially in capitalist society, it's a little bit of a winner-take-all type situation. And uh, and I want it all for black people. You know, I want us to win. I'm very competitive in that, in that regard, uh, but I'm not trying to compete with other black people because I don't think that that's productive. I'd rather compete with uh, with oppression. I'd rather compete with white supremacy. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a little bit tough. Sometimes it seems like white supremacy is winning by about 30 points. Uh, but I believe that if we stick with it and we continue to move forward, if we continue to work hard, we continue to give it everything we got, I believe that we can catch up. I believe that we can win. You know, um, And so if you don't believe that black people can be winners, then this is probably not a good place for you to be because I'm probably going to frustrate you. I'm probably going to make you mad. I'm going to uh, upset your agenda of black depression and sadness. Um, I'm probably going to make you think that I'm delusional. I'm going to make you think I'm crazy. And you know what? Here's the thing. A lot of people say that I'm crazy and they are crazy. They, they are right. They're hundred percent correct. I am crazy. I'm completely crazy. I'm completely delusional. And my goal is to be as delusional as I could possibly be and to be delusional on a daily basis. You know why? I'm delusional on a daily basis because I know I because I am smart enough to know how dumb I actually am. I'm smart enough to know that you know, what I think my plan is for me is not 
uh, anywhere near or as great or as powerful as what I believe God's plan for me can be. You know, I, 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 I know enough to know that whatever I think I can do, I could probably do a hundred times more um, because I've got the power of the universe at my back. Um, I am a believer in the spiritual side of black achievement. I believe that we couldn't have got to where we are without being spiritual people. And I'm very spiritual in terms of how I approach things. So a lot of times, you know, sometimes you sit there and you say, okay, I need to get, uh, I, I've only got eight plus seven and I need that to equal 145, right? But you're thinking, wait, but eight plus seven is only 15. How's eight plus seven going to equal 145? That doesn't make any sense. You know, and, uh, and I'll say, well, you know, I guess we get the first 15 uh, based on mathematics and based on what I see, and the other 130 is going to have to come from what I don't see. That's going to be the spiritual bridge that's going to link the, the, what I perceive to be the possible with that which is perceived to be the impossible. Right. And if you think about it uh, throughout our, our history, all the, the people that have achieved the most in our community, all the people that have gotten us to where we are right now are people that went into impossible situations. You know, I mean, even, you know, and you guys know that I've, I've been one of those people who has been crazy enough to even challenge, you know, some of some aspects of the civil rights movement. But you have to give those individuals credit in the sense that I don't think any of those people, you know, when they were sitting there getting beat, you know, beat by the police, locked up every other week, kicked out of school ate up by dogs, sprayed with water hoses, spit on by white folks. I bet none of them, you know, said, oh, yeah, in 40 years, I'm going to be a congressman. You know, it's, it's some of them are some of them, literally some of the people like John Conyers and others are congressmen now. Right. Uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, that a lot of people that have accomplished great things. I don't think uh, when Nat Turner was, you know, surrounded by the slave masters and, and the, the troops and the police and everybody else and about to be killed. I don't think that Nat Turner knew that he was actually going to inspire black people for the next 300 years. I don't think he saw that, right? And so what, one of the things I, I do know about life is that, you know, you kind of have different sections, right? You've got, you've got the stuff that you know, and then you've got the stuff that you don't know, and then you've got the stuff that you don't know that you don't know, you know? And so at the end of the day, we're all stupid. You know, we're all dumb. We, we, don't, we, we don't know shit about what we're capable of doing. You don't know, stop it. Stop acting like you know how great you can be because you don't you have no idea right so so shut it all off and you go in and you just do your best you pick a dream you focus on that dream you meditate on that dream and then at that point it becomes metaphysical where you will find yourself slowly but surely moving toward that dream or if you don't get there then maybe your children will get there they don't get there maybe your grandchildren will get there but everything you do is planting a seed for somebody else so what is my sick ridiculous uh, maniacal idiotic dream my maniacal idiotic dream is that uh there will be a black hollywood and it is going to be uh fabulously amazingly extraordinarily huge it's going to be worth a trillion dollars we're going to be producing movies with budgets of a hundred million dollars two hundred million dollars uh we're going to have uh hollywood stars and starlets and and it's going to be black owned and it's going to be amazing and maybe and maybe it's going to be in existence in the year 2075 right maybe it's going to be in existence in the year 2118 uh but either way i believe that what we're doing right now by work being the hardest working black people in the community in this generation by being the most visionary black people in the world in this generation by being the most forward thinking black people in this generation. I believe that we are, uh, we are to black Hollywood, what Henry Ford is to the automobile industry. When Henry Ford started making cars, they were crappy little cars. They were mediocre little cars. They were just little putt putts that, that basically weren't much better than, a, than but not even as good as, as a modern day go-kart or moped, right? But he was planting a seed. He was getting it started. He was beginning a process, right? So for us, uh, Black Hollywood, uh, my vision of it right now is that we're beginning a process, and uh, and we got to go 100% hard. We got to go uh, full time, at full speed, all the time, and give it everything we've got because every inch that we move, we're moving somebody else forward a couple of feet, a couple of yards, a couple of miles, right? And these are children, grandchildren, and other people who are watching this video right now, there's some child in the year 2019 who's watching this video right now. So just the same way I'm talking to you right now, I'm talking to them also because they're watching this video at some point in the future and they're gaining inspiration to achieve some of the vision that we have right now and they've got more resources to do it with. Why? Well, because we left them a billion dollars in assets that they can now utilize to implement the vision that we have right now. You see, even um, if you, in fact, uh, George Lucas, uh, the white boy who made Star Wars movies, when he made the Star Wars movies, it was really fascinating. 
he wrote the books in such a way that the books that, that or, or he wrote the scripts, I guess, or his vision of the whole Star Wars series was done in such a way that the technology to do what he actually laid out in the vision was not there. They did not have the technology. Films, you know, couldn't do what he, he, what, what he was saying that he wanted to do back in 1976. But what he did was he laid the groundwork. And so later on, when the technology caught up with the vision, suddenly they were able to do all the things that he wanted to do, but he knew he couldn't do at the time. But he laid the groundwork. He planted the seed, right? So what I'm trying to say to you now is, um, you know, there might be limitations to our budgets, but there is no limitation to our imagination. You know, there's no limitation to our ability to analyze, ability to break down, our ability to plan. Uh, no, there's no limitations to what we can visualize and lay out on a piece of paper. And then what you do is you just start working toward getting the resources you need to implement that vision. So what is the vision that we're talking about today? Uh, by the way, I want to say to everybody, um, uh, those of you who are on YouTube, I'm going to share this link one time so that you can actually come in to the actual screening if you want to come in and join us. Uh, I am going to shut off the YouTube connection in a second. Uh, this was an invitation for the students in the Black Business School, uh, but I decided to go ahead and let you guys out there just kind of have it if you want to come in. So if you want to come in, uh, you got to come in and register now. Uh, in fact, I think all the space is going to be gone in a second because this, this webinar only holds so many people. Uh, but what we're going to do tonight is we're going to screen uh, something that we've been working on called Black Capital. I've been uh, visualizing a project like this uh, for about four years. Um, I just, I, I've talked about it a little bit here and there. If you follow me real closely, you probably heard me talk about it, but you probably haven't heard me talk about it if you only see me say once a month or once every couple of weeks. Black Capital is, <clears throat> is something that, um, that I'd always wanted to do um, that involved uh, some sort of scripted series with Boyce Watkins Films. Uh, we've made a lot of movies so far, or quite a few. We've made uh, Resurrecting Black Wall Street, The Blueprint. We made uh, Democracy, A Black American Horror Story. We also made The Black Love Blueprint uh, and some other things. And so uh, Black Capital is kind of the latest creation from Boyce Watkins Films. And uh, in order to do it, uh, one of the big challenges we had was we said, you know, making these movies is so expensive, but we're smart and we're black and we're, we're better than everyone else. So let's figure out how we can do something high quality on a reasonable budget. So we found this guy, I, ran, I was shooting the Black Love Blueprint and I was in Brooklyn when we were shooting it. And uh, Dorian Chandler was the, the director on the Black Love Blueprint. It's out there now if you wanna go look it up, it's on Amazon. And, uh, and, uh, I, I, and I was introduced to this young uh, millennial, this young brother by the name of Peter Parker. Uh, and that's two K's and two R's, P, or like P-A-R-K-K-E-R-R. -R. So he spells his name a little bit different, but you know, you, it sounds the same. And so I met Peter and uh, I was really impressed with him. He was introduced to me by Jay Ortiz, who was a rapper out of Philadelphia, a, a young guy that I just loved to death. And, um, and, uh, and so I just talked to him and I got a sense of who he was as a person. Um, he was very cool, very nice, uh, seemed like a person that uh, I could possibly work with. So I made an agreement to, uh, to talk to him later. And we talked again a little bit later and we formulated the, the idea of black capital kind of out of these conversations. And uh, one of the things that I liked about Peter was I said, you know what? I said, one of the biggest problems I have with the film industry is I think they overspend. I think they spend way too much money. They spend their white people money, you know, and I don't think black people have money to just throw away and burn. We spend a million dollars just to reshoot a kitchen scene or what that doesn't mean anything. Uh, we don't have that kind of wealth. So I said, I'm looking for somebody that knows how to um, do something uh, impactful but not break the bank, right? So, uh, so basically, Peter said, "I'm your guy," and, and so he came in, and I, I, wore, I saw him do the work, and 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 I was so impressed. And uh, actually, Peter tonight is going to come in, and he's going to talk about the project and how he put it together, and what he did to, you know, kind of get it done, and how he gets done with great projects on a budget. In fact, Peter has worked with a lot of amazing people. Um, actually, the way he got discovered, and I think he's important for it, especially you young people that are looking to get ahead and hustle to get ahead. Uh, and that's what the whole black capital concept is about. It's, it was designed for millennials between, say, the ages of 25 to 35, but everybody can enjoy it. Like, I really enjoy it, but, uh, but that's the age group that's featured in this. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to really encourage or to give millennials kind of a space where they can just learn the value of being a straight hustler, you know, like hustle, like, like creativity, being able to say, look, I can do this. I will do this. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to get together. I'm going to use my resources. You know, I, I don't like it when we teach our young people to be depressed and to be sad and to give up and, and tell them, oh, well, racism got you shut out and shut down. You ain't got enough money. You ain't got enough assets. You don't have enough know-how. You, you can't go to college and spend $8,000 a day to be in college. You know, so, so I, I don't like that. I like the idea 
idea of giving young people um, this this belief that they can do anything. And, and 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 sometimes even the belief makes them crazy like me. Like I told you, I'm crazy. I love being crazy because I like having crazy dreams because I'm too stupid to really know exactly what I'm capable of if I really give everything I've got. So I want young people to have crazy, impossible dreams. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of times our dreams are not crazy enough, as Colin Kaepernick said in that Nike ad. And uh, and I love Peter because he had a crazy dream. He found a way to get it done. And you see that in the way he does his work. Like the way he got discovered actually was he wanted to do a video for, you know, a well-known hip hop artist. So J. Cole, J. Cole's, you know, one of the biggest out there. And Jay apparently, it's Peter will come in later and he'll tell you this story. But Jay, uh, from what I understand, you know, I mean, you know, he, Jay didn't know who he was, you know, and, and he couldn't get in touch with him. It's hard to get in touch with celebrities. You got to call their person who's calling somebody else who's calling somebody else's. It's a pain in the butt, right? Well, J. Cole, anyway, um, basically, he, um, uh, Peter basically decided that he was going to take matters into his own hands. So what he did was he took a J. Cole song and had the initiative to shoot a music video to the J. Cole song, right? And he shot this video to the J. Cole song, and then he put it on social media. And from what I understand, the, the song went, or the video went super viral. Everybody loved it. It was all over the place, like the biggest thing in the world. And guess who found out about this amazing J. Cole video to this J. Cole song? J. Cole, right? So because Peter had made such an impact on his own independent, no budget, no nothing, J. Cole wanted to meet him. He then said, who is this guy, right? So that's how he got his attention. Next thing you know, he's working with people like that all the time. I mean, he's worked with a lot of people from Snoop Dogg and to the major networks like Lifetime and Netflix and all kinds of stuff. I mean, now he's really busy. Now he's a, he's, he's kind of becoming a big shot. Uh, it, but he's only 27, and I, it's an honor to work with him. And, uh, and Jay Ortiz was in, in this project. There's a lot of other great people in there, and, and I'll mention all that, but, but uh, I'm going to start.